This is Coffee with Holistic Dog Professionals. Learn from Roman and David how to become your dog's best friend. Good morning. Um, I just give you a heads up. Good morning. Some viewers may find our conversation disturbing, so viewers discretion advised. <laughs> how are you doing today? I'm well, sir. How are you? I so appreciate you being here because we're gonna get a lot of backlash here, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is controversial, absolutely. Yeah, so <laughs> I just give you a heads up. Um, I mean, you know that already, but to, for the viewers, um, I'm a crossover. Um, many years ago, I was an aversive trainer. I did boarding training, I did pet care, I used chalk colors, I used, um, Choke collars. I didn't use prong collars for some magic reason. Um, and I came from a school where a dog is wrong has to be punished. And I took my lessons. <clears throat> I got several bite injuries back then. I can count like I paid out of my pocket about sixteen thousand dollars in you know bills. <laughs> oh my word! From you getting <laughs> bit? Yeah, and stitches oh because I was stupid enough to buy into you know, this belief system that if a dog is wrong, it has to be punished, if a dog has to be submissive, and, you know, you have to be the boss and the alpha and all this crap. Right. And, and I I had good mentors, I thought. <clears throat> I read a lot of books, I thought. I had this um, idea that, well, it's a book, right? Somebody wrote it. Somebody had experience. They're telling that they were on TV shows and trained famous people, and I was like, yeah, that's it. I need to do that. I had no clue. Um, I remember I was not knowledgeable enough to do things by myself, so I hired a trainer to train my dogs not to leave the property, I thought. And then I saw how these people work, and actually I took it personally because this person basically abused my dog. And then I saw it from a client's perspective. And I was like, wow. <laughs> Yeah, it's heartbreaking, I know. I, am I doing the same thing here? And it was just a wake-up call. And, um, you know, sometimes when you work with your own dogs, you're biased. When your own dogs, you are in a privacy. If you work with your own dogs, your emotions are different. You're kind of in a safe environment. You get a tame explosive. You can get your anger out, like, you know. And I had to wrap my mind around that and accept that I was wrong. I had to accept that my method is abusive. Even if so many people say it's good, then I start digging deeper into that and looking into what is it, what are the what do other people say about that? Because I was listening only to my people. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I was only watching my people and I was doing only training consultations with my people. And then all of a sudden this whole world opened up into a new dimension where the dog is not always aggressive where the dog may have issues maybe the dog has environmental triggers and all this stuff and this right. is where my switching point was i'm just giving a heads up for those people who says oh he has no clue he hasn't i have done it and you think you have done bad things you haven't seen me doing things but i i apologize and i feel bad about it um i had to pay my price and um i was happy that i had my my community and my friends, some people pointing out on things, and I was able to kind of wrap my mind around, my mind around that and says, wait, let's see if I can make it better, different. Right. Leave away my old experience and let's try something new that I haven't tried before. And all of a sudden, the bite injury stopped. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I was fast to bringing results. And all of a sudden, I could work with more complex dogs. Um, and so here we are now. And I so appreciate you being here today. Thank you now, for tell having me. About, me tell me about your story. And I apologize because I went rough on you at some point. Um, you're welcome to share that if you want. Um, because we, we need to become aware that we're not just keyboard warriors coming out there talking smash about people. We have to, we're coming from an angle where we need to clear out the dog training community and make it healthier because it's unhealthy. 
and we need to help people um, to recognize what to look for when selecting a professional. Everybody can call themselves professional because you make money, you are professional kind of sort of, but many people are not professionals. They pretend, they're con artists. All they want to do is make quick money because they're not making a different way of living anyway. So they're doing that what they do, think they do best, taking people's money and pretend the dogs being better and, and, and lying to those people and make those dogs be eventually put to sleep or tortured or, or unfortunately, you know, people and kids get hurt. So right. what, what's, what's your story? Oh, um, by the way. <laughs> when I was, oh, I've got my little protein drink today. It's 120 degrees in Arizona. <laughs> so good. Well, it will be this afternoon. But yeah, it's the hottest part of the year for us here. Um, well, as far as being a dog trainer, when I was learning, I was getting all kinds of conflicting information. I was trying to absorb as much as I could from as many people as I could. And there was always this butting of heads between the, um, you know, like the working dog trainers, the compulsion trainers, where the dogs have a job to do and they can't be reliant on uh, food because they have to be able to ignore food to do their job. Right. Um, and then on the flip side, it's, you know, the rescue community and the domestic pets where people are trying to just train their dogs or rehabilitate them um, from emotional damage or abuse. And they're not sure how to do it. And they look to those types of trainers to help them. And those types of trainers are not really uh, experienced in rehabilitating emotionally damaged dogs or dogs that, um, you know, just have been under socialized or have all these issues. They're selectively picking from breeds specifically for those tasks. So it, then the people start to get into more corrective methods because they don't know how to you know, fix or stop an unwanted behavior. They're focusing more on the aggression instead of what's causing the dog to want to be aggressive. If you can change that where you get to the root cause and you change that from a negative to a positive association, that will make the dog feel less need to be aggressive. But if you're trying to combat aggression with aggression by alpha rolling or Caesar jabbing or, you know, all of this nonsense, that is what gets you bit because it's out of self-preservation. That dog doesn't know you. It doesn't trust you. And now you're trying to manhandle it. You know, it's um, out of self-preservation that the dog, I think, would bite and then not want to work for you. Um, so I had to come to my own conclusions by learning from as many people as I could and taking what works for me from everyone and leaving what didn't and then trying to formulate my own method or, or, or approach to working with dogs. And the most important thing is to focus on teaching them the right behaviors. You know, redirection as opposed to correction has always been a little phrase that I use. And that's really a good way to um, be able to differentiate aversive trainers from positive trainers or reward-based trainers is what are they focusing on? Are they focusing on uh, correcting or fixing the bad behavior or are they focus on laying a new foundation of wanted behaviors that the dog can now offer for a reward i think that's the biggest difference there i i totally agree with you i remember i i started also from the perspective that a dog who does a behavior a wrong behavior has to be punished that was my thought Mm -hmm. Looking back into the way I was raised, I was never good enough to do things. Everything I did was wrong. Basically, I was punished all the time in one way or the other. I, I had to, you know, suffer physical and emotional abuse because I was never good enough. So I can see that from a dog's perspective that if we have certain expectations on a dog uh, as a trainer, we will, the dog would never be able to reach that level of, of understanding what's going on because dogs don't have logic. I thought dogs have a logic, a logical conclusion, the reason why he does it, because he's mean and he wants to do it because of me. So he has a strategy to do certain behaviors. And then I, I recognize that dogs don't have that logic that we expect them to have. 
they have something that we call memory. So, so they can remember all these things. They have this capacity, this immense capacity to store so much memory in their body about all the events that ever happened to them in very detailed form. They don't see pictures. They have this emotional feedback. As soon as a picture is matched with emotional feedback, this is what the dog then follows up with the response. It's basically like a computer. Is it safe for me? Yes or no? No. Am I in a place that I can run out of? Yes or no? It's kind of like a yes and no question. It's either or, either or. It's a basic level. We have dogs who are a little bit more advanced in the way they can associate information, um, making decisions, complex decision, being able to compare multiple data. Um, and I feel those dogs is what most people are struggling with. The better, the most educated dogs, guardian, black, black guardian breeds, mastiff breeds, um, guarding, like, um, sorry, um, protection breeds, and even herding breeds, and even, we go even hunting breeds. Hunting dogs. dogs have so many different facets and breed traits. So yeah, I understand what people says, well, you know, a, a bad dog cannot be a good dog at some point, and an old dog, you cannot learn breed traits, all these, these conclusions, but the reality is if that would be the case, <clears throat> no dogs will be changing food, no dogs will be changing environment, because basically they will shut down. If you cannot teach an old dog new tricks, how would you teach him to go in a different place to eat, right? <clears throat> how would the dog be able to evolve himself if you would not be able to adjust. And back then, I remember reading those books, we had about like 40, maybe 20 scientific researchers around dogs, but we lived with dogs more than we lived with any other animal. I think we knew more about apes and lions than we knew about dogs. We thought we knew everything, but actually we didn't. And so this old training philosophy of how to see dogs in the first place as the aggressive predatory killer who you open your home to bring in. Well, you know, we're doing this for 40,000 years. That concept is not right. So what do you think when we, when we, when you would hire, let's say, for example, what questions should be included if you want to hire a trainer. So I, I made a list. I hope I hope you agree if I post them here. Um, what would your first question be? Well, for me, I ask about their education, their background. You know, where did you study? How did you learn to become a dog trainer? Who were your mentors? Because you can get a lot by, you know, who they learn from because they're going to apply those um, techniques. So that would be my first step is, you know, how much do they really know about dog training? Um, then maybe look into uh, clients that they've had in the past, you know, reviews and testimonials, um, even though those can be, you know, fabricated as well. Um, my questions really are, how are they going to address <laughs> behavior? You know, what do they focus on? Do they focus on immediately correcting and talking about all the different ways to fix behavior or do they talk about laying a new groundwork a new foundation of wanted behaviors and teaching that first you know that's the most important part is teaching them the right things you know, um, so it's really what they talk about let's focus a little bit on the methods so if we ask a trainer what are your methods that you use most people says well I have scientific evidence methods. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's science. Um, oh, yeah, it's science. And then all of a sudden people get shocked. I'm like, oh, 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 it's science. I have no clue about science. Obviously, you know more than I do. That's a tactic. Throwing such a big number out there, oh, it's science. It's complicated. You have no clue about it. Let me tell you, honey, what it is that we have a problem with. It's dog psychology, <laughs> okay? And obviously you have no clue about dog psychology always because otherwise you would have a problem with your dog. Right. Now, I feel this is a tactic of intimidation coming from that angle, intimidating the client science. 
I would ask more questions. Tell me about the science. What kind of science is that? Is it which science? Is it veterinary science? Is it zoology? What is it? That's it's science. animal science. You know, it's it's how dogs learn, how they um, perceive, how they take in information, and then apply it to their basic needs. You know, that whole Pavlovian ringing of the bell and meat is how they learn about everything. They pair what's important to them with something that is, you know, important to us. And then my next question would be, great, um, where did you got this science knowledge? Did you study when you were in college? Um, do you have a degree in animal care or you have a degree in animal behavior? And then it's like, oh, I, I, I did a course. All of a sudden, kind of go down a level. Yeah. I did the course. I, I graduated. I graduated too. Everybody graduated. That's kind of the term. We have to really dig deeper as the client and see what school is that which graduated? Oh, it's a training school. Okay. So that training school, which is not regulated in the US, um, can use any methods that are available out there, which is not regulated in the US. So everybody can print out the letter, create the website, start creating an academy for dog trainers or you know behaviorists and whatever and then start teaching whatever he knows about stuff with no credentials and start getting money for it and start pouring poor trainers that really love their dogs they really want to help people they let them out like wild animals abusing animals all over the place without having technical backgrounds so if you go deeper and you look into those training schools, who is the who, who has that school? What's the team of them? What, what's his background? Oh, he's a master trainer, and then everybody gets stuck there. What is a master trainer? Is it a title? Is it a degree? What is it? It's nothing. Yeah. It's really nothing. every dog's different. Somebody calls himself a master trainer because there is no other master. And just that link, master trainer, should already ring a bell ego driven yeah it's a master trainer like there are the trainers that the educated trainers there's a certified trainers, and there is the master trainer <laughs> yes master <laughs> i i get it uh, at some point you want to differentiate yourself as a professional out of that chaos of really non-educational trainers and you have a better education because you work more years in the field and you said well i'm a better trainer than the others so this is the key factor um, that I feel people should look into. Look at the credentials. And again, even the credentials are not regulated in the US. The credentials are made of groups of trainers who put together a group of other trainers and says, hey, let's create a group. Let's create a group of balanced trainers. And we agree upon what methods they use and we certify them. We make money, we create a club, we are strong, we can affect the, the, the business and the community. Let's get together. And then we have the other trainers who are forced group trainers. And they says, wait a minute, we're not, I'm not, I'm not the part of that group. I'm going to create my group. Let's create our group. And all of a sudden we have these groups of professionals creating professional guilds, let's say this way. Mm -hmm. And then they, they push their own agenda of how they see animal behavior. And most of them don't even have a degree and most of them don't really have education because there is no education out there yet that is credited in the US. Some of them are educated um, through universities. They, they did a course of animal behavior and they got certified. Some of them have PhD and some of them are veterinarians and they have a veterinary degree in animal behavior and animal science. There's a very scientific aspect of that, but that is not good enough to go in the field and work with heavy dogs, with difficult dogs. So if we ask the person, what methods do you use? I want to see it. But you can tell me whatever methods you use scientifically evident. I can I see that research that satisfied that. Mm -hmm. 
in the 60s, we had no scientific evidence. We barely came out of positive training, starting the idea after um, Skimmer that conditioning and positive conditioning and negative conditioning and positive and negative and reward and punishment. And now we, everybody tries to wrap his mind around that, but wait a minute, conditioning. And then people came up and said, wait, we have emotions. How do you condition those? And this field opened up more and more. So what methods should people look for on your opinion? Well, obviously reward-based. You know, you want to be focusing on telling or showing the dog what he's doing right, not only what he's doing wrong. And I think punishment doesn't have to be painful. You know, it could just be a marker like wrong. Let's do something else. You don't have to add like all of this loud noise and anger and emotion. You know, so like if a dog jumps and I say ah, ah, and turn and ignore it and I'll say sit. And the dog sits, yes, good boy, and I reward him. You know, that's not anything painful or scary. It's just like marking right or wrong, letting him know that's incorrect. I need you to offer something else for that reward without projecting emotion and anger and all this physicality onto it. So that way the dog is starting to understand, okay, I need to offer something else to get that treat. And then when they do, it's marked with the yes or good boy or click or whatever you want to um, mark that behavior with. I, I agree with you. Now, I, I, let's, let's play a little bit. I want to look from the other direction, as I believe. Mm -hmm. Positive. What is positive? Treats, 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 treats. You know what? Life is not always treats. Right. Life is always, you don't get treats. <laughs> okay. Now we see also the, the belief system that I am a positive only trainer. I'm an R positive trainer. What, what does it mean actually to be a positive R trainer? Well, positive reinforcement is, is just rewarding the dogs for what they do right. If they do something incorrectly, they just don't get the treat. They don't get the reward. It's not like adding an aversive, like a physical correction or, or a like loud auditory marker or something that would um, startle the dog or spook the dog into not wanting to do that behavior. Right. It would seem to me that's what it is. So let's explain a few things. Let's say, for example, I bring my dog over to me and I'm a trainer and I ask my, my dog to sit and my dog wants a treat and I don't give him that treat. What is that? Um, that would be um, negative punishment. Oh, wait a minute. But I'm a positive trainer. Like, wait a minute. Well, I totally got confused. So I'm a positive trainer, and not giving my dog a treat is a positive a negative punishment? Well, according to the psychology definition, yeah, it's removing something that the dog likes um, to get a desired behavior. So we want to kind of clear out a little bit that operant conditioning doesn't tell you about punishment with the mean perspective. It just explains what's, what's happening here. So in general, if you add things to the dog's experience, that's positive. If you remove things from your dog's experience, that's negative. If a dog feels something will affect him to change his mind, what would that be? Um, I'm not sure I understood the question. Let, let me rephrase it a little bit. Let's go closer here into that picture so we can see that better. Mm -hmm. okay. So if I have a positive reinforcement, positive reinforcement is when you walk and your dog checks in with you, and you give him a positive feedback, good, or you give him a treat. Yes. Now, when you have a negative punishment, it is where your dog wants to do something and he doesn't get it. So negative punishment delays what the dog wants in order to decrease behavior. So I want to remove the dog from pulling on the leash and therefore 
I'm not giving him that length of the leash for him to move forward. Okay, that would be negative punishment. Yes. Punishment, not with the punishment with the meaning of punishment, but I would say it's a negative consequence. Now, what if I have a negative reinforcement? Where um, the, what, that's like removing the um, positive punishment. That's removing the aversive. Exactly. So if a dog is exposed to a problem that he has, and I remove him from there, that would be a negative reinforcement. I take yeah, him away if it's something the dog doesn't like. Right? And what would be a positive punishment would be actually jerking, kicking, punching, yelling, and do anything in addition to my dog's already having a problem with. So we see yeah, that all that stuff is negative punishment, like the squirt bottles, the rattling of the cans, right. you know, anything that you're adding, bringing to the table to stop the behavior. Right. But raising my hand and asking my dog to stop is also positive punishment. If I put my, my hand in front of his face, it is positive punishment. You see, we have to be very careful how we classify those ideas. You can be in the inner ring of the four quadrants, and if you say your dog stop, I'm adding positive punishment and put my hand in front of my dog's face, and then I ask him to sit, which is a negative reinforcement, and then my dog does it what I want, and then I give him a positive reinforcement, and all of a sudden we see this kind of complex. You cannot just be a positive trainer, but you can be a positive trainer and a positive punisher and a negative punisher and a negative reinforcer if you are in that space, in the inner circle, mm -hmm. not in the outer circle. Choking your dog, not good. Right. Telling him no is an option. Does the dog know what no is? The moment you block him from something he wants to do, you're intervening in that situation. So yes, you have to play in the four quadrants because that's what the dog understands. But you shouldn't sure. go in the outer circle of the quadrants because that becomes abusive. Positive only reward without having emotional feedback is as abusive as it can get. If a dog wants information, all I do is giving food, he doesn't get information. He's being lured to a situation he cannot handle. So I understand where balanced trainers coming from and says positive training is bad, balanced training is good. But that is a tricky, tricky path. Because right. punching the dog using aversive tools like prong collars, choke collars, e collars is not the inner circle. That's the outer circle. <clears throat> because we're, we're dealing here with an emotional feedback where the dog's going into helplessness when they're exposed in multiple triggers they cannot control. Where they're unable to function in that environment. That, that is a whole other story. We're going to talk about that. So when you ask your trainer, what methods do you use? The answer would be, from my perspective, I use the methods that my dog responds best, is his best and highest good, and I'm not putting in any harm. At no point I want to cause my dog stress. At no point I want to cause your dog pain. At no point I want to cause your dog confusion. And I would use any tools that I have in my toolbox. Scientific proven that it is helpful and it is healthy and it doesn't cause any harm to help that dog change his experience. Without the use of prong choke and e collars, spray bottles or shaker cans. Because really all the dog you want is to survive that situation. And as a behaviorist, I want the dog to thrive in that situation. So it's not about surviving, it's about thriving and knowing what to do and troubleshooting skills. 
most definitely. And focusing on the state of mind of the dog, you know, when we're looking for trainers, you want to watch them work with dogs and see how the dog responds to them. You know, are they like happily engaged? And, you know, what can I do next? Or are they like, oh, geez, you know, they're like cowering and nervous and, you know, not wanting to look at the person or, you know, something like that. The overall demeanor of the dog lets me know if I'm doing it right or not. That's really what we want to be conscious of is how is the dog feeling about what we're doing? I so agree with you on that. Um, yes. Having education and being a graduate of any school is one thing. How about the continuous education? I know trainers who did the training education 30 years ago. Not only that, they went to military and they are certified dog handlers. Did they catch up with new evidence that is out there? I'm getting about two or three notifications a day of new scientific evidence of certain things that science catches up on and says, oh, wait a minute, back then we thought it's this, but now we recognize it's that. Now we have MRIs. Now we have GPS trackers. Now we recognize the dogs don't behave like wolves. Now we know that wolves behave like dogs, but differently. They are not like pack animals. They're family animals. They have family hierarchy, not linear, like broad. They have friends into the family. They learn from the family, they learn from the siblings. And then we recognize, oh, wait a minute, we have 800 million dogs out there that are not pets. Nobody looked at those dogs, they're for free. You can sit there and watch them and educate them and learn from them, from interactions. I was talking to a scientist down who is in, um, we will have him on the, on the show at some point. Um, he was, he's an anthropo anthrozoologist, so he's studying the relationship between dogs and animals. And another scientist also observed that dogs leave their own family, meet friends, play with those friends, come back to their family for a sleepover. And then they observed that other dogs from other groups come over in that family invite the dog to go to the other group this dog never went before and hires him to fight another dog group without personal benefits. You're gonna blow your mind what we suddenly know about dogs. Uh, <coughs> so now we recognize dogs are not just beasts. They are relationship-based beings. They want relationships. They're not pack animals, they team up in groups. So. If we go to the next question, what is your initial assessment of my dog based on the methods that we use? Who do you think my dog is up to right now? How can a, a person judge a trainer based on his assessment? How would you assess a dog? Um, I would say their ability to emotionally connect with the dog. You know, if there's like a disconnection there or an awkwardness, you know, then that's really not a natural trainer. You know, they're just kind of in it for the money. You have to be able to connect on a spiritual and emotional level with that animal, I think, to develop that trust for them to trust you to overcome their fear. It can't just be, you know, give me the leash and I'm going to zip them into a heel and you know, stop them from doing everything just by a uh, harsh correction. It's just not reality, you know? So um, if they're focusing on that, that's when we want to, you know, walk out the door. I had an experience. I went to a mechanic. I know it kind of sounds weird, but I went to a mechanic. I'm driving cars for many years. Like, I remember driving cars when I was 16. Um, and, and I worked in, in, a, in a mechanic shop. But, you know, having these modern cars with all these, you know, technology and computers. I don't have the equipment to measure. So I'm going to, to the mechanic and ask him, you know, my car has a problem. Uh, can you tell me what it is? And he takes his device, plugs it in. He asks you for money. You know, I have to make the evaluation. It cost me an hour or two. And I was like, what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? I'm going to spend money for you to tell me what my dog, what my, what my car has? Don't you see what my car has? I'm telling you what my car is. 
Yeah. And he had a very good response. He says, if you knew what your car problem had, then you would fix it already. You don't. I don't know what your car has because I don't see it. I want to go in and look at it. I want to compare data and information. Mm-hmm. And so I'm educated to compare this data. And I have a program that analyzes the data and give me eventually results. And based on that results, I'm going to narrow it down to one or two. And then I can give you an estimate. And I was like, yeah, you're right. What I hear as a sound could be so many reasons. What he goes into the root of the problem to understand why this sound comes in for. What type of sound is, where is it coming from? When did it start? What happened before? What happened after? How long is it going on? So how do you do your assessment? How do I do behavior assessments? <clears throat> um, I follow Sue Sternberg's assess a pet. So the first thing we do is see how the dog responds to direct eye contact while they're crated or behind a barrier. Is the dog going to perceive me as a threat or are are they going to bark and lunge? Are they going to cower and run away or are they going to just kind of wiggle butt and want to engage? And then one of those three responses usually. Um, Then based on that, I'll take them out and just stand there with the leash and see where their attention lies. Are they going to want to engage with me? Are they going to be at the end of the line trying to sniff and investigate and the environment's the only important thing? Um, Then I want to see how they are with being handled. Will the dog let me pet it? Will it let me pick it up, touch his paws, examine his teeth, um, that kind of thing. And then we see how they respond to, um, you know, other dogs, cats, kids. You know, first we use a little baby doll and a little life-size Barbie. Um, to see if that spooks them on a different size person or if they're going to look at that as a play item. Then we test test prey drive. Um, I use a flirt pole. It's like a horse whip with a toy on the end. And then I just start moving that around to see if the dog cues on it and really wants to go after it. Um, We test loud noises. You know, I'll just make like a loud, "Ah!" Um, not too close to the dog, you know, depending on the dog's confidence level. You know, if they're fearful, I'll get really far away. Um, If they're confident, I'll do it right behind them, just a clap or a drop of a clipboard or something like that to see how they respond. So it just gives me an overall idea of the dog's confidence level and sociability. Good. When I work online, the first thing I want to do is I want to see the people interacting with the dog. I look into the relationship. How does the dog see the person? How does the person see the dog? I don't assume the dog is aggressive. I don't assume the dog is wrong. I assume the dog is not aggressive and I assume the dog is right. From my perspective, a dog does a behavior because it functions. It works for him. It has a reason. I want to understand the reason why he does this behavior. What is going on in his mind? In what state of mind is the dog when he makes that decision? I've seen trainers when you know you go to a facility and they trigger the dog and they try to provoke a negative response or right right Mm -hmm. and they do it very smart they go close and stare at the dog see he's aggressive and you know and you have kids in your house are you kidding me with that kind of aggression you shouldn't have that dog this dog needs you know strong handlers Handlers with power, handlers with leadership, handlers with alpha, go for it. <laughs> and I was I was watching that video. I felt so sorry for that family because that dog was actually a good dog. This family only wanted that puppy to be trained. And that person scared the shit out of that dog. The puppy was seven, six months old. What is that age? It's a second fear phase with a dog suddenly becomes fearful of outer environment outside of his family. Now, those professionals are trained specifically to make money out of that situation. Kind of like selling insurance. What? You don't have, you, are you, you don't have insurance? No, your kids can gonna die, your house is gonna burn. This fear porn comes into the equation. 
and now suddenly that family is scared like literally a professional telling you your kids are in danger and you're gonna die that's a great assessment well i can fix it guaranteed and then the question comes in um how do you see the training progressing like what's the time like oh well no we cannot we can guarantee you the results but we cannot guarantee you how you would screw up the dog so i'll take the dog in says that trainer give me three weeks it will be like a lamb he will obey to you he will do whatever you want you will be his master guarantee something goes wrong it's definitely you <laughs> and it's perfect. you know this people says oh my god i will never be able to handle that dog anyway that's why i'm here so maybe i should how, how much does it cost again okay boarding training feeding personnel business overhead you're looking at 1500 oh you have kids 2000 oh you have babies make it three three thousand we're good and people are like what should i do i love this dog i love my kids i love my family my husband or my wife give me the amount of the dog or myself <laughs> i have to do this how do you see training progress here? well it boils down to the commitment of the family and their understanding of what the trainer is is trying to teach them if as long as the trainer is doing it correctly giving them the right information then it's up to them to carry on that way you know they can't go back to doing exactly what they were doing before and expecting their only their dog to change it's a cause and effect situation you know i think Board and train can be problematic if the owners aren't on board with the training. It's not going to be drop the dog off in three weeks, come pick or, and come pick it up in three weeks, and then it's a robot. That's just not reality. Come on, you know, they have to be involved in the training process. Give Dave What's some that? I said the people to click on those hearts because I feel that's a key factor. If you don't educate the people who made it possible for the dog to reach to that particular level. The dog doesn't always come up with that behavior in one day. There is events happening. There is lack of knowledge happening. And if those people don't have that knowledge, whatever the trainer does in his facility, and the dog goes back into these environmental factors that affect his behavior, he's going to go back to square one. Because there's no consistency. I, we may, go oh, go ahead. I was just going to say our board and train programs, we involve the clients and we take the dogs to their home throughout the board and train process. It's not just, um, you know, come back in three weeks. We meet um, multiple times every week to make sure we're all on the same page with what we're doing. I think board and training is a good thing for dogs who are in transition from the shelter into a foster from the foster into the end user <clears throat> because we cannot expect from fosters or, or homes who never dealt with that dog to be able to handle these kind of situations especially dogs who have been through bad experiences come up from a shelter some of them are over 200 days in the shelter like the, 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 the long-term dogs or shelter dogs and most shelters and most facilities don't have training personnel. They don't have the funds to train those dogs. So these dogs have been totally stressed. So I would totally agree that from the shelter into the training facility, from the training facility to the foster with trainer supervision, and then the dog is being adopted. I get that. I agree with you. But if a dog is already at home, he's there since he's eight weeks old. Taking the dog away from the family and going into a boot camp, boot camp, <laughs> and we talk about those trigger words like this is how you recognize the, the weird stuff. Boot camp, yeah. like what do you mean boot camp? 
That's my dog wear boots. Are you booting my dog? Are you kicking with your boots, my dog? Like what exactly comes the boot? Oh, it's military boot camp. Oh, I get it. So you're gonna train my puppy who's a pet even with babies, being like a military style trained dog. <laughs> like bomb detection or explosives or fighting people put this off to take them down or arms or ankles like a police dog thing. Oh, what <laughs> the training is not a concentration camp. The boarding facility should be able to recreate the environmental triggers with all these exposed. Yes. Yes, there will be a cap. Yes, there will be a room. Yes, there will be other dogs. Yes, there will be small children. Oh, wait a minute. But they're not the same children we have at home. Those children are not family. So the board and training facility is limited in what it can offer. It cannot recreate a home environment. If the dog is guarding his owner, how you will be able to convey that information in a boarding facility where his owner is not there, where the dog is not guarded, where his dog doesn't have that problem? Well, in that situation, it's good because the dog learns to bond with multiple people and work for multiple people and learn that not all people are threats other people can be i don't know what to say masters or you know leaders or you know in charge of that dog to where they're not going to look at other people as a threat and it can kind of help with that over bonded relationship with their owner i would think i mean i've seen that happen in the past where they become less guarding because now they look at new people as a good thing somebody to get treats from and, and that kind of stuff um, I, go ahead. I agree with you um, I also have seen dogs who being removed from their home mm -hmm. have to readjust into a new environment that adjustment period I call it imprint period lasts about three weeks in these three weeks, the dog has to reevaluate the situation, rethink his environmental triggers, and rework himself out of the reflexes into it, into more brain functions. What do I do? Where am I? Who is this? Do I have this in my data bank? Do I know this dog? How do I respond? These are new things. So there's a lot of enrichment into that. There's a lot of new learning into that. And then the dog goes back into what we call old environment. But in reality, it's not old. It's different. Because of this new information that is out there that he passed through these three weeks, he comes in his new home with a new perspective. The home is different. He has to re-imprint into that situation. Mm -hmm. How many times have you slept in a hotel? Do you feel all hotels are the same? How many times have you been in the same hotel, but you haven't been in the same room? Different room, different smell, different soap, and already things are different. <laughs> different towels, <laughs> different reception. But so many factors make that difference, and you don't like it. And then you say, well, I hate these people. I've been here for 10 years, and now I don't like it. I'm, I'm leaving. So if a dog comes in from a foster boarding training, goes back into a home, and that home is not ready for it, and not adjusted already, and not welcoming the dog into this new condition where the dog is being seen differently, and not with the blame, oh, are you trained now? Are you a better dog now? Will you follow my instructions, even if they don't make any sense? And the dog is like, you know what? I don't take your shit. That guy I was working with for three weeks, he knows his stuff. He told me what to do. He makes no any sense. You, you don't make any sense. I will not follow your instructions because you haven't changed. I changed. I know more, but we are still the same. So I believe the progress of training is 90% depending on the home the dog is in. 10% is basically the dog, because we know 
that over 50% are environmental factors that affect the dog's behavior. Absolutely. 40% are genetics. I don't have seen any behaviorists do genetics modifications in a chamber and changes the dog genetics. It's the environmental factors that makes the change. And the human is 100% in control of those environmental factors. Some of them are medical issues. Some of them are nutritional. That's why I put the 10% marker in. For 90%, it's the owner who affects those factors. So if I would be a trainer, would you be able to guarantee the results of what you have worked at the boarding facility? Can you guarantee? Well, we, can, we guarantee we do the work and then we document it by shooting video to show them they have something to fall, you know, to follow, you know, look back on. They can check these videos out and see what we did to get that desired behavior. But we can't guarantee animals because they have their own will. They can exercise it at any time. You know, and I if can't be were, responsible for a dog that I'm not in control of. If they were to guarantee how behaviors change, we would be out of business. <laughs> I would love that. I, would, I don't want to see dogs in shelters. I don't want to get kids getting hurt. But there is no guarantee. We can't even guarantee our human relationships. Even if you sign a paper and get married, people change, dog change. There's so many triggers out there. So one other thing that I, I recognize is that when we do the test and see about the dogs and what else do we ask a question? For example, I would ask the question, if you work with my dog, what happens? If my dog does what happens if the dog doesn't get something. What if my dog doesn't do what I want him to do? What's well, here, this is this is the kind of the decision making between corrective trainers and positive reinforcement trainers. So, you know, a corrective trainer would be automatically correcting it in some way, marking it with an aversive. Um, I was taught to look at my mechanics and look at what I'm doing because whatever I'm doing is not clear to the dog. So I need to reassess my approach, take a different approach, you know, try different things, find out what really drives and motivates the dog and use that as the bridge or the lure to get the desired behavior. I agree. So my answer to that would be, if my dog doesn't do what I want and my dog doesn't want what he gets or does he get what he wants, what will be the consequence? Punishment, no. Consequence, yes. Consequence is not punishment. Consequence is the feedback to the dog's actions. So if my dog wants a treat and he doesn't get it, what will my dog do? He will bark at me. Will I punish that? No. I just give him a feedback that barking doesn't work to get that offer an alternative behavior. Oh, so that's a good when sit. He, when he barks there, what do you do? I don't. You just like you you ignore him? Do you stay? Do you keep looking at him? No, no. I don't look at him. I'm not challenging him. It just doesn't work. Barking doesn't work. The dog will do something different at some point he will think about why barking doesn't work. The moment he stops barking, there you go. Not barking works. You want more of that? He's like, yeah. Thank you for not barking. You want more of that? Yeah. What do you do for it? Um, not barking? Ooh, for a longer period of time. That's a jackpot. I teach him that Try something that may work. Don't try something that doesn't work. And the dog has to go through his program and say, wait a minute. How did I got ever treats? He's going through his data bank, you know, matrix, kind of the numbers running down and up. And he remembers, oh, if I sit, I get treats. 
Ooh, that's great. That makes me smile. That gives me emotional feedback. That gets you a pet and a treat at the same time. And your dog is like, holy but did this just happen? If I sit, I get all that I want? Yes. If you don't do that, you get nothing. If you do the right thing, you get something. So if you don't give your dog a green line for him to walk on, why would you punish a dog who has no clue what you want? <laughs> right. <laughs> because there is another factor that many people miss. Expectations. People have expectations. They go on Facebook, go on YouTube, see this perfect dog performing perfect, and it was like, why can't I have a dog like that? I was wondering sometimes, why can't I have a dog like that? My dogs have all PTSD, abused, neglected, almost killed, medical trauma, physical trauma, physical trauma, uh, natural disaster trauma, like I have, I have a chaos in here. They're well behaved kind of in, to that context. But I wish I had a dog of those people posting the perfect dogs out there. That's just 3% of all those dogs were out there. It's just an illusion of having specific expectations. I would say the word, sometimes I feel people are narcissistic about their dogs. They want the dogs to be perfect. They want the dogs to be a perfect family dog. So they match with the car. Like you have a Subaru, you have a Golden kind of thing. What do you think should people have expectations of a dog? Or expectations from a trainer working with a dog? Well, I think everybody has goals, you know, on what they would like to achieve with their dog. But you have to understand, is the dog mentally able to do what you're asking them to do you know if it's suffering emotionally or fearful or anxious it may not be able to lie down and stay at that particular time because it's worried about you know self-preservation or it's you know just too nervous or too overly excited so sometimes we have to recalibrate our expectations if you have a dog that's antisocial or one that really just doesn't want to be in large social groups you know that may not be the dog to go to the dog park you know, we're trying to force something on the dog that the dog is not ready for or not enjoying. So it's it's important to really have a give and take kind of relationship with the dog. It can't just be all about what you want. It has to be uh, what the dog is mentally and physically able to do. And you guys kind of meet in the middle to establish a nice cohesive relationship. I agree. I see sometimes people have this White fluffy dogs, they bark, they guard, they go after the neighbor's dogs, they go after strangers coming in the house, and they say, I want my dog to be social. And ask the question, can you tell me again what breed do you have? Oh, I have a Great Pyrenees. Oh, really? So you want the Great Pyrenees to be a social butterfly, love everybody who comes in your yard, you want him to follow you, even if you're not there. How, how do you want that to happen? So you want the Ferrari driving in the desert, <laughs> really. You have to understand that the breed traits that you choose a dog from is being bred for thousands of years to do a particular, to have a particular mind around his environment and now you expect the dog to match a pet it's not a pet it's a working dog yes the dog has tendency to guard you can work with that but you can expect the dog not to guard because it's inbred it's like saying a cop to not react if somebody gets shot it's like saying a fireman not to react if he sees a house burning and people screaming if you're saying a medical person not to respond if a, if a person has a cardiac arrest. These people are are born with certain traits that makes them so special. Right. Will a fireman work in a kiosk selling newspaper? No. Will I put a cop being a medical person? Maybe because the concept is the same safety, security, but I will not be able to pull a medical person doing a person job to 
because he would not sacrifice and he would not kill any person because he's a person to help people survive, not to be hurt. So the trainer should have proper expectations and he should transmit those expectations, reasonable expectations to the person. Your expectations, man, are way off, okay? You have a bulldog and you don't want him to bully. You have a greyhound and you don't want him to be triggered by things that are flying around and speeding up. <laughs> really? Come on, man. <laughs> so you cannot even guarantee that as a trainer those wrong expectations in my question i have one question what do you expect your dog to be i want to know what the person's expectations are so i can tell him if these expectations are feasible because either he will blame me or you blame the dog he needs to know what the what what the upper limit is or how long he has to work to get there How, how do you share the expectations? Do, do you assess breed traits? Oh, absolutely. Most definitely. I mean, you have to know your dog. You have to know not just the breed, but the personality of the dog, because you can get eight different personalities in one litter. You know, there can be cautious ones. There can be overly competitive ones. There can be more selfish ones where, you know, they don't want to share or, you know, more antisocial. It's just a vast array of personalities and temperaments. So you've got to know each individual dog. When you know your dog and you know what triggers it or what stimulates it, then you can be proactive by developing a game plan ahead of time. I know my dog is going to do this, so I'm going to be ready, you know, to redirect it at that time. But if you're not and you're taking a more reactionary approach, then it's too late because the dog is needed direction at the time and was not given it. And then it acts on its own accord, and then it gets in trouble. You know, for those so as long watching, as you're, uh, go ahead. Sorry. What's for those who are watching, just a heads up, because we are already over an hour, we have oh. four more questions, OK? We will have 10 topics today, so we're going to cover everything. So stay tuned with us, and you eventually can share the video so other people can learn too. OK, back to you, sorry, David. Oh, no, that's OK. Um, so the next question was, can my dog learn everything I want him to learn? Bring um, the newspapers. Walking with well, it depends on the dog. Why? You know, I would say probably not. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a bad trainer. <laughs> you're a bad trainer. <laughs> it really depends on the dog, you know, because they have to want to do what you want them to do. If they have their own either breed characteristics or personal issues or past experiences that may impede their ability to do what you want them to do. The question, can my dog learn everything I want him to learn, comes ready from a wrong angle. What I want him to learn. What if what you want the dog to learn is so much and what the dog can perform is that much? <laughs> What if right. you want a Belgian Malinois, you want him to learn to be quiet, and you want him to be calm, and you want him to be a couch potato, while your dog can be of service, while your dog can perform, do things you have even magic you can do. What if you have a Mastiff, and you want him to behave like a pug, and you don't see his potential? He can take your kids to school. He can visit hospitals. He can help people calm down just by being next to them. What about you have a German Shepherd that you want him to be your guard dog, but that particular dog has the potential to sniff one particle per billion and be of help in your community. How about your German Shepherd will be able to go in a school and teach people and children how to behave around dogs. Don't limit your dog's capacity to your narrow-minded mindset about what the dog should do, but what your particular dog is capable of doing. 
Yeah, that's excellent. And that really boils down to not, to, you know, like what you were saying there. It's a, like a selfish kind of uh, question. Can my dog learn everything I want him to learn? You know, maybe what you want him to learn, he's not ready for, is unable, but there's a vast array of things that he can do that you don't even know about because you haven't went there. You haven't tested him or tried him at, say, agility or scent work or something like that. So, yeah, that's excellent statement. I remember I got a phone call for a client. Um, he was in Florida, I remember now. And so he wanted to surrender his pressure canario for biting him. So we had, I, I, based on online training, I always have a questionnaire in the beginning. It's about 20 minutes to fill it out. But then we have a, in an hour session, we have a 20 minute conversation. I try to kind of see the timeline of events, recognizing, you know, the pattern. And then I recognized that this person, when the dog was biting him, he was always on his desk. And this dog started from snapping, pawing, barking, biting, hurting, drawing blood. And I was like, how long are you sitting on your desk? Well, I have an online job. I'm sitting on my desk about eight hours. Okay. And how many times do you take your dog out? Well, twice a day, one in the morning and one at night. And all the other time you are on your computer? Yes. And when is likely your dog spiking you in the morning when you sit on your computer? This is no, around three o'clock. And then I asked him the question, how do you feel about around three o'clock? Like, are you as fresh as in the morning? Well, you know, sitting on the blue screen all day can be depressive. And that's where the bell rings. I feel depressive around three o'clock. When does your dog start biting you and nipping you? At three o'clock. When does your dog draw blood? At four o'clock. And I was like, have you ever checked if your depression is something that has been there for a while? He said, yeah, I'm a manic depressive. I am on medication, but I haven't taken my medication for a month because I had some other issues. Kaboom. I said, here, what I'm going to do. Every time your dog snaps at you or sparks, sparks at you, measure that time. And next day, you're going to start 20 minutes earlier on that particular time and take your dog out for a walk. And take, man, take a break of the computer. Go outside, do something. Because I think that dog is your emotional alert dog. And he's like, what? He said, hey, man, sorry. I called you because I want to surrender my dog and you're supposed to know any rescues. And you're talking to me that I have an emotional support dog or alert dog? What? And I was like, give it a shot. Give me three days. If your dog starts snapping, snapping or barking at you, I would like you next day to start one hour earlier. Take your dog out for a walk. Entertain your dog. Spend some time with your dog. Get some fresh air. And then the other question, you know how money depression is. Let's sell, I'm telling you, I have a money depression. I feel depressed. What would you tell him? Go outside, take a walk. What is the dog trying to tell you here? To go outside, take him for a walk. He called me a month later. He said, thank you. My dog has a new meaning in my life. Thank you. I'm so grateful I have this friend of my dog because I wanted to put him to sleep and the veterinarian told me we would call a rescue. My dog never snapped at me again. Now I taught him to give me his paw when it's for me time to get off my computer. You're welcome. That's amazing. Because people see what they want to see. He's getting married because you see one particular thing and you don't see the capacity of that person you're going to marry. 
being in a dark relationship is seeing the potential, is reaching the limit of what you can do to that dog for him to be thriving in your family. And if I'm a trainer, I want this person to go that level, not down here, up there, wherever that is. I don't know if your dog can do belly ups, if your dog can do rollovers, if your dog can carry a newspaper. We don't know. We're going to work on that. We're going to try different things and see how that works. What do you answer your clients' questions if they say, if I don't learn everything this time, do you give me a discount or a retake? Like, how do you handle this kind of like, problem situations? Oh, I'm with them for the long haul. I don't mind giving as many free lessons after they've paid for the board and training package or the, the private lesson package. Um, you know, I don't mind coming out to help them for, for free. I'll stick with it because my most my biggest concern is that they're happy and the dogs are happy and they're moving forward. Okay, That's I something agree. that we offer. I agree. I, um, I have my individual package. I have my online sessions, the functional behavior assessment, the first one. Like, that's a no brainer. We stop there. I need to understand what's going on, timeline of events, history, medical history. I need to know everything, nutritional, anything that comes into the equation. Um, and then, usually we're done in five sessions. I don't do boarding because the dog is being trained by the, by the caretaker anyway. Um, but I, when I'm going through the process of, of mentoring that person, I'll be able to put that information in five sessions. Whatever he needs to know about his dog in his home, that particular breed, this particular environment. Will he be a professional? No. Will he be a behaviorist? No. Will he be a dog trainer? No. But he will be the best one for his dog. Better than me. Better than other trainers because the dog has a relationship with the dog. And the person will know what I would know working with that dog. So therefore, my client is better than I am by the end of the story. So if that's not good enough because something changed, I have a follow-up group. I think you have a Facebook group too where people come in and say share their experiences and they, and they share the problems after the training. Hey, my dog has diarrhea. Oh, my dog just grounded somebody. We take the first buffer into that group. And other people who have done the same experience before, have the same concept, are basically supporting themselves. They're learning by educating others at the same time. Remember the training sessions. Remember what we talked about. And I supervise those answers. And so if an answer comes a little bit wrong, I step in and say, hey, guys, let me clear that out. So while one person has a question, I educate all the people that I have in my group at the same time. The more questions, the more education. It doesn't take me long. It takes me like 20 minutes a day, half an hour, an hour, depending on you know what we see there. It really doesn't cost me a lot. And this is where there comes the next question. What do you do to ensure your client's success? Continuous education. As much education, I have a folder, and maybe you have one too, you tell me about that, where people have continuous access. If you're my client ever, you have access to that folder, and in that folder, there's always new coming information. The client asks a question, I was like, yeah, I haven't covered that chapter yet. I read something together, put that in, in that document, and people can read up on that. They can ask questions. Sometimes I post this in a group, if it's not too long, but everybody goes back in this folder once in a while and search for it. And I think that doesn't cost me anything. It's for free. Well, the client paid for it, as we said before. If it was a training package, if that package conveying information is already there, it's already, you paid for it already. It doesn't cost me. It cost me, but you paid already that in the package, what you will learn in the future. And definitely, it's not hurting anyone. Education is a good thing. Mysticism and secrecy is a problem. That goes back to the trainer. 
I wouldn't hire a trainer that doesn't let me look on his folders. I don't like a trainer who doesn't look me at these educational levels. I would not choose a trainer who doesn't tell me where this information is coming from, where I don't know where his idea is coming from. You have to be the alpha. Show me that scientific evidence. You have to be the boss. Show me that evidence. Something, somewhere, something. Give me one. Show me that you have to be the pack leader. What makes you the pack leader? Definition of a pack leader. Oh, have you watched these on the last videos? Whoa. That's how far your science goes? Are you watching Animal Planet 2? Is that how you get your dog education from? <laughs> no, thank you. I got a behaviorist. So these are, these are tricky things that people need to know. So what do you do? How do you secure your clients' success? Um, by giving them as much information as possible. You know, it's all about education, education, education. And if I'm not sure, if I can't, you know, get something to happen, then I consult with others of a higher education or more experience um, to try to give them as much information as possible. And almost the last question. What is your policy if I'm not happy with the training? Giving money back? Um, I normally don't. That's in the contract because we did the work. Um, if they're not happy with the training, then um, they need to recalibrate their expectations on what dog training is. We're not creating robots. They're in the end. They're still animals. You know, at the end of the training session, it's still a Belgian Malinois. That's you know. 12 months old and bouncing off the walls. I can't change his personality. I can teach him a series of wanted behaviors, but that then hands back over to the owner. They have to continue that process. Um, you know, that's unrealist, unrealistic expectations a lot of times. I agree with you. I see many times people, um, when, when they don't trust online training, when they don't know what it is, I say, you know what, let's do this. I'll give you one session. You work on that. If you don't see any improvement, you get all your money back. You win. I win. Because I learned from you, and you learned from me. It didn't work out, so that's fine. It's okay. It's a new experience for you. Mm -hmm. If I work with a package, things change a little bit. We have the same one session. You don't like what we do, all your money back, we're good friends. Stay on my Facebook group, hang around. If you need, eventually come back again later. Try another version, see how that works for you. I know the person will come back to me if he struggles at some point because mm -hmm. he has a freedom of choice. At the same time, though, he has access to my folders. He has access to my videos. He has access to my knowledge that I've worked for so many years. Man. Now that's worth a lot of money. Mm -hmm. You have that. You can go in. If if I feel you have sneaky about it, it does make me happy. So I think I leave it to the person's discretion. You want to give your money back? I'll give you the money back if you want to. If you really got zero information out of it. If that assessment that I told you exactly what the root of the problem is is not good enough for you because you wanted to hear something that you want to hear as much as your perfect idea, but it's not the reality, it's not my fault. However, because of certain situations, I don't like people who talk back behind my smack. I say, you know what? I don't want you as a client. Take your money with you. Everything is fine. If you don't have that decency of saying, you know what, person sit down for me, share this information, you know, David talked to me, spent some time, showed me different versions. I get it. And finally, do you charge for help in between your sessions? Uh, well, no, not like if it's on the phone, you know, if they have phone questions or something like that. But if they would want me to come back out there, then, yeah, you know, because that's my time and distance and driving and all that. But phone I, consults are free. I personally 
don't charge in my package in between sessions. Actually, I want people to like, send me text messages, send me videos, whatever questions they have. Usually, I just copy paste the document or show, send them to a video, send them to another lecture that I did in the past, and the answer usually is answered. But beyond that, if I see things are more complicated, I tell them I have, a, I have a two sessions, a 20 minute sessions. I can sneak them in between my training sessions. Schedule one of those, they're for free anyway. So we take care of that. Like my dog goes nuts suddenly out of nowhere. Or we have home coming for visit a couple of people over the weekend. What should I do? So these are quick things. It doesn't cost me a lot. Right. If you have a lot of clients, that would be a problem. You have to navigate. But since we have the self help group, all these things fall away. So do I charge for help between the lessons? No, actually, you paid already for it. I want you to communicate with the communication supported between trainer and client all the time. So if somebody tells you you have to charge you extra for that, oh, okay. Do I have to take another class? Do I have to hire another trainer to get the message right? Because I tried what you told me and it totally failed. Like, what do I do? Pay you more? <laughs> no, I usually ask them to film what they're doing. You know, let me see exactly what's going on here because it could be just a timing issue, right, right. you know, missing the mark kind of thing. I so appreciate you today and thank you so much for people joining our group. Um, thank you for having me. I hope we give a lot of answers and looking forward to your messages. So if you need help from David, you can reach him at www.zenk9.org. And if you need me for extra help, you can go to holistic.training.org or slash online training and, and get help that you need immediately, as quickly as possible. Because if you don't reach out for professional help, and you play your time on Facebook, try to answer questions. In the meantime, your dog recessed and goes further down the hill. Don't wait. Get answers now. Get professionals' answers now. Reach out to trainers who are certified. Reach out to trainers who have experience with the breed, who can give you a track record. You don't need to hire a package because you see the trainer the first time. Do a training session. See how it feels like to you. Would you leave your child with that person? These are things. So thank Absolutely. you again for, for being here today. My cough is almost done. I have to refill. And <laughs> we we'll talk next time, um, next week, same time. You got it, sir. Thank you for having me. Have a great week. We'll talk you to you too. soon. All right. Bye now. This is Coffee with Holistic Dog Professionals. Learn from Roman and David how to become your dog's best friend. I love you, We don't have a coffee. No. I have to buy it. <laughs>